Let's start with the history and physical of the eye. Now this is a uh, video from OptoBook.com. You can find other videos at OptoBook.com in addition to free uh, download of the book and the PDF file. Now the first thing you're going to notice if you rotate through an ophthalmology clinic is that our note is very large, it's very confusing, and there's a lot of jargon on here. Um, as you can see in this little sample note here, there's a bunch of stuff here you don't normally see in an eye note. Some of it may be familiar, but a lot of it isn't. And so I'm going to go through some of this bit by bit. Now with every note, you do a history of present illness. And this is the same as any other note you write in medicine. And you know how to do this already, I'm sure. Basically, you find out what the main complaints are and you ask the big questions, which are what, where, when, why, um, and so forth. Now with the eye, the big complaint is vision, and so there's a bunch of specific questions you need to ask. For example, most patients complain of some type of blurry vision. Now the big question here is, how blurry is it? For some people, blurry vision means that uh, their eyes are a little dry and they're seeing 20-25 instead of 20-20. For other people, blurry vision means no light perception. So this is a relative term and you really need to tweak that out. Now is this a blurry vision that's worse with television or with reading? That might indicate something along the lines of dry eye because people blink less when they're doing concentrated activities and when your eyes dry out they do get a little blurry. Now is this a glare problem? People have problems with glare if they have cataract. So if their uh, vision is blurry at nighttime when they're driving and car headlights are coming at them, that might indicate some type of cataract problem. Now the other big question of course is, is this a problem with near vision versus far vision? After about age 40 to 45, people's lens start to harden and they have a hard time concentrating or focusing on near objects and they develop presbyopia and they'll need reading glasses. Another big question uh, or complaint that patients have is irritated eyes and so you want to ask some of the big questions here. Are, are they red? Uh, is there any uh, stinging which might indicate dryness or uh, an abrasion on the surface of the eye? An aching pain may be something uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, watering or discharge which might indicate an infection and once again is this worse with television or with reading from dryness. Now one of the big review of systems uh, in our field are flashes and floaters. Floaters are the uh, sensation of something floating across your vision and most people have some floaters. If a patient has them you gotta ask are these new or are they, are they old? A lot of people have uh, old floaters and they're nothing to worry about. But if they're new floaters then you gotta ask also if they're having flashing lights. Uh, both of these things might, both of these entities might indicate uh, uh, either uh, bleeding inside of the eye, uh, those little blood cells will cast a shadow uh, retinal detachment, something along those lines, and you have to rule that out. Headaches. Uh, if you have an older patient, you, of course you want to rule out the temporal arteritis symptoms. So you ask about scalp tenderness, claudication of the jaw when they're eating food, polymyalgia is basically muscle aches in the shoulders and neck. Uh, if it's a younger patient, you want to ask about migraine symptoms, such as visual auras, jagged lines, uh, weird scotomas, nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light and sound uh, in sort of an episodic pattern. The medical history, the things we concentrate in ophthalmology are diabetes since uh, it causes a lot of problems in the back of the eye, asthma because we give a lot of these patients beta blocker eye drops for pressure, and of course hypertension because that causes some problems in the back of the eye as well. Past ocular history, you want to ask about all past eye surgeries and be sure to ask about cataract operations. A lot of people uh, forget that they had a cataract operation, not considering that a surgery. And also if you ask them what eye drops they're using, this will give you a clue as to what they're being treated for. Family history, we're worried mostly about glaucoma and blindness with allergies. Uh, focus on the sulfa drugs. Some of the pressure lowering drops we use are sulfa based and so we don't give them to the people with an allergy to this medication. And with medications, of course, ask about their eye drops, see if they're on any blood thinners before you go to surgery, and ask if they're on any oral beta blockers. Now, on to the physical exam. Now, to this point, you probably considered the vital signs to be blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, things like that. Within the world of ophthalmology, we have a whole different set. And these are the big three. V is for vision. P is for pressure, and T just means tonometry or pressure. So vision, pupil, pressure. That is the mantra that we use. Those are the three vital signs we need to get before we do anything else with the patient. 
The reason being that if you put a dilating drop in a patient, it will mess up the vision. It will obviously mess up the pupils because they'll be dilated, and dilating drops will often mess up the pressure. And so the dilation is actually the rate limiting step to our exam, so we want to get these three vital signs before we go any further. So let's go through each one of them. The first one is vision. Now, when you see our note, we kind of write our vision and our vital signs in this format, and all this means is a big V is for vision, C means with correction, basically with glasses, and then on the top we write the right eye, and on the bottom we write the left eye. So this patient is 2100, uh, pinhole no improvement, I'll go over that in one second. And then the bottom, they're 2020, minus one, which just means that they missed one of the letters on the 2020 line. Now we can also, instead of saying the big V, we can also say a big N, which would just indicate near vision. Um, SC means without correction, um, but let's uh, continue with this. So you want to check uh, near vision with all your patients, especially if they're having blurriness close up because people have presbyopia, like I mentioned. Now, what is this thing I'm talking about with a pinhole? Well, basically, you can uh, see if your patient's vision will improve with a pinhole. Basically, punch a hole through a piece of paper or our visual occluders actually have a little pinhole built into it and have them reread the eye chart and see if their vision improves. And if it does, that indicates that their prescription may not be strong enough or maybe they've got a cataract and the pinhole uh, allows a little bit of light to kind of sneak through the uh, opacity. And here's the theory how it works. The idea being if you have misaligned rays, a pinhole will let the uh, direct ray go through. And that will take care of actually a couple of diopters of uh, correction. And this is how pinhole cameras work to focus light. Uh, pinhole is actually a, a nice system for focusing light. However, it limits the amount of light that comes into the eye. And so in advanced um, organisms, uh, we've uh, progressed to a lens system. Here's the pupils. Uh, the three things you want to ch check with any pupil exam are the briskness, the symmetry between the eyes, and whether there is an APD, an afferent pupillary defect. When you check the pupils, I usually start with one eye at a time. It's best to use a very bright light. It usually works better in a darker room. This little hand light is probably not strong enough, especially if someone has dark pupils. Now, if someone has an APD or an RAPD, which just means relative afferent pupillary defect, what that means is one eye does not sense light quite as well as the other eye. Now, when you just look at the pupils, that can be very subtle, and it's very hard to judge uh, pupil size. And so one thing that we do is the swinging light test. And what this does is lets us figure out if one eye is not seeing light quite as well as the other eye. Here's how it works. With a normal pupil, you'll get constriction with your light, a little bit of dilation as the flashlight goes over the bridge of the nose, but mostly a constriction, 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 and so forth. However, if you have an abnormal eye, you'll get constriction, and then when you hop over to the bad eye, you get a little bit of dilation. Constriction, dilation, constriction. Now this was pretty obvious in this little graphic, but it's a lot more subtle in a patient. And so it helps to have a flashlight and to do the swing light test and go somewhat rapidly from eye to eye. And you can pick these things up. Uh, the final thing here is tonometry. That's just pressure. And there's a couple ways we can check tonometry. I've written here AP. That just means applanation, and that's the pressure checking device that's built into the slit lamp. Another way you can do it is with a tono pen. So let me show you what we're doing here. This is applanation tonometry built into the slit lamp. That little blue light, a little device actually pushes on the eye and checks the pressure that way. It's the most accurate way to check it. Another way to check it is with a tono pin, and that's just a little mechanical device that uh, we use down in the emergency room or with patients who can't get up to the slit lamp. And you just basically tap on the eye with it, and it gives you a, uh, a reading. Not as accurate, but sometimes that's all you've got, and you've got to go with it. Extraocular movements, we check ductions and versions. Basically, you have the patient follow your finger. and Now, here I am going up and down, left and right. That's not quite accurate. What I really should be doing is this, going up and left, up and right, down and left, down and right, because this simulates the, uh, the actual motion of the eye muscles uh, to a better extent. Confrontational fields. Have your patient cover one of their eyes and cover one of your eyes, and then have them uh, count your finger in different quadrants. Now, if you hold your hand equidistant from them, that'll give you a better idea uh, of what they ought to be able to see. Basically, if you can see your fingers, they ought to be able to as well, and you can pick up uh, a little bit more subtle defects this way. 